You're listening to Forward Faster, bite-sized insights for entrepreneurs. Hello, and welcome to Forward Faster. I am Sujatha Ramanujan. I am the Managing Director of Luminate, the, program with, the optics program within NextCore. And I'm also a board member of the Optical Society. And I'm here today with Claudio Mazzali. He is a Senior VP at Corning Optical Communications, an OSA Fellow, and co-chair of Fios this year. So welcome to our program, and we're excited to have you here. Thank you. Happy to be here, Sajanta. So tell me a little bit about Fios and what we can, what are the big focus for Fios this year? Tell us about the conference. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a unique year. I think uh, 2020 is a unique year for, for many things, and it's going to be a unique year for Fios as well. Fios is, uh, it's of course, one of the most important conferences that we have at the Optical Society. Um, and this year, uh, we are following a few others uh, and trying to manage that with the, with the COVID challenges. It's going to be a fully virtual conference uh, this year, and we're taking that um, with, a, with a positive spin. I think there are a few things that we can, we can even take advantage of our challenges and making sure that more people can attend. Um, the cost for attendees will be lower because it's going to be fully virtual. So it's pretty much free for attendees. Uh, the authors have to pay a small fee, but uh, that would allow uh, an audience to be even bigger. And there are so many things happening in optics these days that we are, we are pretty excited um, about the program. Uh, we have uh, fantastic plenary speakers. We have uh, Federico Capasso from Harvard. He's going to be talking about meta surfaces and, and some really disruptive technologies uh, in that area. Uh, Nurgis uh, Mavalvola from MIT, also with some uh, amazing work on uh, detection of gravitational waves uh, using optics. So lots of lots of different things. Um, the conference this year not only is uh, co-located or or co-happening since it's virtually uh, uh, with LS, but also with Quantum 2.0. So the Quantum 2.0 conference will be happening at the same time, and we are taking advantage of that. So there is a lot of emphasis on quantum as well. Um, and regarding regarding teams, we're going to cover the typical the typical topics of frontier and optics that we do every year. We're going to have a little bit more specific theme around uh, AR, VR. Uh, and as I said, we have some visionary speakers that will talk about some other areas, quantum optics, um, ultrafast spectroscopy, and some other areas. So we're pretty excited about it. So this is the first time it's been online. So do you? How many people do you think will come? And is it? It's always been an international conference. So do you expect it will be bigger or the same size? Or what are your thoughts around? As soon as we we communicated that this would be a fully virtual conference, then we got a, a peak in the number of paper submissions. I think everybody was just waiting to see if they would be able to participate and come to DC. Or now that's virtual, uh, we actually get a very large number of submissions. So uh, the number of papers is pretty high, higher than in, in prior year, uh, which is great. Uh, so people are willing to share their work uh, and to, of course, interact with the community, even in this in this new um, format. Um, I think the audience is going to be uh, probably larger. And the reason is because, well, you don't need to travel uh, and, and you can attend from whatever you are. Uh, there are some limitations, of course, when you think about uh, time zones. Uh, our colleagues from Asia may have some more of a hard time to attend during the entire day, perhaps. But I, I believe that we're going to have more people attending. It also bring, uh, being, being virtual, it brings some other flexibilities, right? For instance, um, I think we're going to have more oral talks. Uh, Frontier in Optics is very famous for the, for the poster presentations. Of course, uh, we, we have a, a, a format where it's a kind of a poster presentation online, but we also have more time for oral talks. So people that were on the, on the edge, they may be invited to give a, a, a oral talk. So that may also, um, be pretty good. So again, we are, I, I, I don't want to say that we know how to do this. We are learning. I think, uh, Optical Society actually did a fantastic job at OFC. OFC happened when things were starting to close in March and they had to do a kind of a hybrid uh, overnight between face-to-face uh, -face and, and virtual. And I think it worked well. Uh, Clio was already uh, virtual and I think we got some good feedback, but every conference, the Optical Society is learning. And um, I think by the time of Frontier in Optics uh, in September, I think we'll be, I, I think this will be a very good conference. Great. So 
COVID is really changing how associations serve their members. I see that we have this virtual conference, which personally, as a student, I would have found it really exciting because I remember when we were or an early professional, when you couldn't go to very many conferences because you're financially limited and they'd only send one or two people. So this is, I think, very exciting for people who otherwise would not have had a chance to go. So I see that as kind of a, a good thing that the society is doing. But can you comment on some of how the association is changing in general to serve its members? What have been some of the you know difficulties you've seen? And what do you think are some of the potential opportunities that OSA could take advantage of? Yeah, so you mentioned one, right? I think uh, we... I mean, we, we all have that experience that when you're a student, uh, you you have to fight for that grant, even if mainly when you're from a different country. Um, I I did my undergrad in, in Brazil, and I remember that, you know, you finish work uh, and you want to present your paper. And after you did all that, you have to apply for a grant to see if you can, you know, get your, your air ticket to come to U.S. for another place to present your paper. So I think this would allow uh, more students, and uh, we know the optical societies is in a in a continuous effort to be as global as possible and making sure that we have participation from from students and scientists and industry and of course companies uh, from from all countries uh, and increase that diversity of inputs that we get. So I think this would allow us to do more. However, I I want to be realistic, right? I think that. Um, in the in the academic world, or let's say in the scientific world, not only academia but also uh, industrial um, labs, uh, it it is super important to have the personal interaction. So I, I want to make sure that we don't get into the hype of like you know the world will be all online moving forward. Uh, no, it won't. I, I think that it's going to be much more uh, online than we we are used to, and I think that's a good thing. Um, but I do think that the the direct uh, uh, connection is super important, uh, and that will continue. So what may happen, I believe, is that uh, we're going to have a lot of the, the information sharing, the content sharing being more online, and you may end up having uh, a specific face-to-face -face interaction opportunities where really you're going to focus on that. You're going to focus on workshops where you have a group of people sitting in a, in a room and discussing uh, discussing a new area, new technology, not that, not the broadcast from the speaker to the audience. That can be more online, but that workshop uh, spirit, right, where you have people working on the same area that are sitting together and discussing that, that's still important. Can be done online, yes, it can. But uh, I, I think that the personal face to face is super important. Will continue, uh, I think. So I'm going to take a little sideways step here. So that's. You know, virtual and what COVID has brought us. But let's talk about optics now. What are the trends you see occurring in optics? What are some things that you see happening that are really exciting? Yeah. So, um, well, I mentioned one of our plenary speakers, uh, Dr. Capasso, Federico Capasso from Harvard. Uh, he's going to be talking about metasurfaces in flat optics. That's to me an area that uh, it's ready to provide some breakthroughs in real applications. What, what's exciting to me about this technology is that uh, there is fundamental understanding of optics going on uh, in that area, but it's extremely close to real applications. Um, so I, I come from, um, from an in the industrial world, right? So I work for a company in a, we have uh, our, the company that I work at for Corny invest a lot in R&D. So huge investment in, in labs. And of course, the, the connection between a new, um, a new area in science with uh, real applications in real life and products or technology that people be using. If that connection is shorter, right, that becomes more exciting, right? It's more like, okay, we can we can learn here and we can transform that in something that's useful for people very quickly. Meta surfaces to me is an area that uh, that uh, has that 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 aspect. I see components uh, being developed as we speak uh, into that area that will be big disruptions for in the area that I spend most of my time, which is optical communications. Uh, when you think about integrated optics, co-package optics, silicon photonics, all those areas, I think we're gonna we're gonna enable a few things that were very difficult until now, and I think uh, the area of metasurface is one that has a huge potential. Uh, the other one 
Um, of course, there's AR, VR that people are excited about. But then if I go to the other extreme, which is something that is super cool, super interesting from the fundamental of fundamentals of optics and physics in general, um, but not as close to products yet, uh, it would be the quantum uh, quantum optics, which is another area that we're trying to emphasize with uh, FIOs and quantum 2.0. Uh, that specifically to me has, again, a huge potential for, for breakthroughs, including the area that I work with when you think about quantum cryptography, quantum communication, and then you go to quantum computers. Uh, there are different um, schools of thought on that area, but I, I am a believer that optics is going to play a very critical role uh, to, to enable that. And to me, what's interesting about quantum optics is that um, is not only a specific new area of optics or anything like that. It's an application of optics that would require many different sub sub areas of optics, uh, transceivers, devices. There are there are many different things in optics that uh, will be required that to be developed at a different level to enable this kind of subsystem of a quantum a quantum optics system, either for communications or cryptography or quantum computers. Um, in in uh, I'm I'm happy to see that countries, governments, and countries are putting more and more emphasis and providing more funding for that uh, for that area in general. I think uh, we're gonna get the critical mass that is that is necessary. So I'm excited about that too. And of course, there are so many other areas. We work in optics, so we are usually optic fanatics. But uh, I'm giving you two that I think are unique. So where do you see where do you see things in ten years? It's it's been such an such a strange year scientifically as well as in so many ways that um, I think it's caused a lot of us to take a step back and really imagine what things will look like. Yeah. You know, I keep thinking about that, Sujata, because, uh, you know, again, working for, for an industrial uh, lab, um, it's, uh, it's super, even when you do road mapping, right, you need to kind of predict the future or you need to uh, do some future shaping if you can. But we keep thinking about that. Um, if I, you know, the world is very broad, right? So if I narrow down to the areas that I feel I'm a little bit, I'm allowed to talk a little bit. Uh, one area that if you look at the last several years and what's happening more recently, I think the efficiency of uh, of us as a society is growing very quickly. We are getting things done in a much more effective way. And when you think about that and what's happening now, there is a, there is a, a group of things or a set of things that are happening at the same time that I think will create a, a, a bump on that, that, that efficiency uh, that probably is going to be something that we never saw before. And let me explain a little bit more what I'm talking about. Uh, when you combine the, the availability of communications that we have today, and again, that's my area, right? Top two communications. When you combine how much bandwidth people uh, have today or will have even more in their houses, uh, in their offices pretty soon. Uh, and you combine their optical communications, 5G, which is connected to optical communication. So if you, if you start looking at that ability to get information, then you add the fact that this, those networks now, they are all symmetrical. They are bidirectional. So it's not just you get information from a centralized broadcasting source. Exactly, you provide information, right? The the upstream uh, content now is coming from everybody. Kids with their videos, they are learning how to use that network. But imagine in the future when those kids are uh, are ten years older. Um, so the network now allows the entire world to provide that information back and forth. That's one. Now this is happening at the same time that things that like uh, machine learning and augmented reality and artificial intelligence are getting to a point where they are really useful. They are not just a, a topic of science. They are useful. Uh, if you look into the hyperscale data centers, right, the, the Googles, Facebooks, uh, et cetera, Microsoft, uh, they are supercomputers, right? Their data centers are really supercomputers. They are huge artificial intelligence machines that are running algorithms that are transforming this amount of information that the entire world is creating and uploading to the network in useful things. We always going to go through a phase where they are not so useful or they are used just for market applications or to give you the right advertisement. Sure, there is that piece. But if you just think about the potential of that, right, you have all this information coming from everybody getting to those 
humongous super machines with uh, very capable artificial intelligence, machine learning. I think this will create a, such a transformational way in, into healthcare. How can we how can we discover uh, solutions or, or uh, cures for new diseases? How can we help with populations that are uh, in trouble or you know poverty? Uh, how can we how can we bring the value to those communities that don't have access to things that we do that we all have access to? So um, I, I think that's a it's going to be a bump in efficiency that I'm hopeful that the the humankind will actually use that in a in a good direction and and to to distribute that goodwill and and help everybody. So that's that's what I hope. Maybe I'm too too rosy on the future here, but uh, that's how I like to think at least. <laughs> well, I like a rosy future as well. So I don't blame you. There's no point in catastrophizing. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you one last question, but before I go there, is there something you want to just share with our audience? Something like, hey, I, this is on my mind and I'd like to let you know about it? Or... Uh, no, I think I, I think connected to the your last question, right? I, I, I do think that um, sometimes in the world, uh, we are in the United States now, in this country, there are so many things going on, uh, some of them that are making us rethink the way that we live our lives, the way that we treat people, uh, different people. Uh, um, and I think we, sh we should all uh, think that we can all, we can all help. Uh, and this kind of pos positive view of the future is because I believe on that. I believe that if we all realize that uh, we have our mission here and uh, we can help each other and uh, we can treat people uh like uh, like they you know <laughs> they have to be treated and we can we realize we're not in denial uh, about the differences in in the world that, that some people may need more help and the folks that have the capabilities they they should be helping that to spread to spread that uh, uh, that richness that we have in this planet right um, I, I think we may be going through a phase now where we are realizing that and uh, and I hope not only um, for where we are today, but for the future, things will be much better. So anyway, it's back to your to your last question. I'm I'm a, a, a naturally optimistic person. So, <laughs> so tell me something, and this is that standard question that interviewers ask: What are you reading lately? What's on your bookshelf? Uh, bookshelf. Yeah, right. <laughs> I need to have a, 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 an answer ready for that. Well, I'm a, I have to tell you that I'm not a very uh, disciplined reader from the following perspective. I don't read like one book then another. I, I have this problem that sometimes I start two or three books at the same time and reading them in parallel. And then I keep jumping from one to the other. And uh, just be, and I, sometimes it works pretty well because I start making connections between them. Sometimes create a big mess in my, in my brain. But uh, that's what I do. And uh, I... Uh, just recently, I finished a book uh, uh, that was about Boltzmann and talk about his equation. Uh, uh, but that's what I finished. Uh, uh, right now, I'm li I'm I'm in between two books. One is a re a rereading. Uh, the book is called The Beat and the Pendulum. Uh, it's from Tom Siegfried. It's an it's a very interesting book about uh, the physics of information. So it basically goes into the fundamentals of uh, you know how a bit is how much energy you need to create a bit of information, how much energy you need to delete a bit of information. And Tom, the author, Tom Siegfried, he's a he's actually not a scientist. He's a journalist, and he interviewed many people's um, academia, industry, etc. And he wrote in a beautiful way. Uh, how this the physics and the energy behind information, which we usually don't make that connection between real a real entity, a real physical entity, and information. Uh, but I have a pet passion for that topic. So, the beat and the pendulum, Tom Siegfried. That was a good one. It's an old book, and I'm rereading it. Uh, and the other one, I I actually I learned about this book in one of those interviews when somebody asked somebody what you're reading, uh, and it was uh, Life 3.0. Life 3.0 is a book about, um, it's from uh, Max Techmark, it's from MIT, and it's about artificial intelligence, but it's a different approach. It's basically explaining a uh, few fundamental concepts of artificial intelligence and the impact of that on society. So, um, yeah, I'm in this, right now I'm in my, my phase of information and AI and, and, and this uh, learning. Excellent. 
So uh, I'd like to take a moment here to thank you for joining us. This is a, a fun thing that we like to do. So to everybody, this is Claudia Mazzali, and we thank him for joining us today on Forward Faster. If, to our audience, uh, I'd like to tell you, if you can, you can find other podcasts of nextcore.org slash podcast. We interview some exciting people in our field and others, and startups. And so it's, a, it's an exciting collection of podcasts. And I urge you to go look at it, listen to it. So listen to our podcast, drop us a line, offer us a comment. Uh, always, always happy to have input from our audience. So uh, Claudio, thank you again for joining us. We appreciate your coming. Mm -hmm.